Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Natalie Elms, and I will be moderating this event, this event on behalf of Morna Chappelle Children's Support Solutions. First, I wanted to share with you a bit about, about who Children's Support Solutions is and how we help families. Then I'm excited to introduce you to Anne. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, and we wanted to let you know that there'll be an opportunity to ask questions via messenger at the end of the presentation. We'll explain for, further exactly how you do that once the presentation is finished. So our Children's Support Solutions works with families, schools, and child care centers to help children reach their potential. We work with infants to young adults of all abilities, providing a wide range of services, including screening, assessment, individual, and group therapy. Our clinics are open seven days a week to support children and families. Whether your child has a diagnosis or not, our professionals can begin working with them to identify their needs, strengths, and work toward their individual goals. We're very excited to be collaborating with Anne to host this event for you. There's great enthusiasm about this collaboration, and we've already booked another session on advocating for your child on May 28th, so stay tuned. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Anne Douglas. Anne is a Canadian parenting and mental health expert, as well as a mother of four. In her book, Parenting Through the Storm, she speaks about her own experience raising four children with differences. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Natalie. It's, uh, it's great to be here this evening, part of this event. I have to tell you, it feels a little bit strange talking to my screen alone in my house because all my family members are out, so it feels a little odd, but I'm sure I'll get into the groove of things, and I'm really looking forward to tackling your questions at the end. Um, the first thing I want to say is to give you a little, I just want to give you a broad little overview of what we're going to be talking about tonight so you know where we're headed. We're going to talk about when to worry. Of course, as a parent, you worry all the time, but when to worry more. Coping strategies and solutions that will hopefully start to make your life better starting right now. Tapping into support for yourself and your child. The waiting game, which is all about getting on the right waiting list and so on for diagnosis and treatment, tools and resources, and then of course your questions, thoughts, and ideas, which I think will be the most interesting part of the presentation, frankly. Well, I could never do a presentation like this without telling you a little bit about my family situation. Obviously, I don't wanna go on too long because we have a lot of other material to cover, but I thought I'd introduce you to my family. The people you're seeing on the screen, yep, that is my lovely family. So at the end, Julie, then my husband, Neil, our second child, Scott, our baby, Ian, our next, well, I guess our third child, Eric, and then, of course, me. Um, so what I want to tell you about is how awful things were about 12 years ago and how wonderful they are today. I don't have... A lot of time to go into great detail just because we are in a pretty compressed format tonight. But I want to let you know that if your child is really, really struggling, there is hope to have a much happier and better future. So back around 2003, just to paint a, a quick little portrait of what life was like for us, um, Julie was 15 and in grade 10. The depression she'd been experiencing for a couple of years had morphed into something angrier and much more hostile. She developed an eating disorder, she was using drugs, and it would be another decade before she was diagnosed with and treated for ADHD, the diagnosis she believes is the, what, the right one for her. At the same time, Scott was in grade nine and just going through the motions at home and at school, his ADHD was definitely affecting his academics and his relationships. Eric was in grade seven and dealing with ADHD as well as a learning disability related to writing. And Ian was just a baby at that point. Well, he was in grade one. He wasn't exactly a baby, but he felt like a baby to me, as he still does. And in that grade one year, he was suspended six times. I remember thinking at the time, how can somebody be suspended six times when they're just in grade one? This is supposed to be the stage when you're in love with your teacher and your teacher's in love with you. And I thought, what are we going to do? It would take another four years before we had a diagnosis for Ian. And that diagnosis was Asperger's syndrome, a type of autism spectrum disorder. So let's fast forward to the, to the future or to the present day. And I can tell you that after having so many years of worry, when I really worried whether Julie would 
A, live, or B, finish high school, she's thriving. She graduated from art college last year and is establishing herself as a young artist who specializes in the beauty of broken and abandoned things. Then Scott, who's the guy in the blue in the middle of the picture there, um, he went from being so distracted and so unfocused in school to finding his passion, which is working in the computer industry. He's now working in the computer industry in Ireland. And I had a note from his first employer saying, thank you for the gift that is this young man. We love his passion and his enthusiasm and his creativity. It was like one of those moments when you just feel like you're walking in a dream. Then Eric, who is right next to me in the photo, I was worried for years that Eric would not be able to finish high school because he had such difficulties with his, his um, learning disability. And I'm happy to say not only did he finish high school, he's finished college, he upgraded in university, and he is pursuing a accounting designation right now. So I'm very, very proud of him. And then Ian, the baby, Ian is in grade 12, and he is in the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. He is passionate about cars, like we are talking passionate about cars. He's he is on his way to becoming a certified auto fixer kind of guy. So I'm very proud, and I, but more than that, I am so relieved. But I don't want this all to be about my family. That would be pretty boring for everybody. So I just wanted to let you know that if you are having a hard time, things can get a lot better. And that having a child who is struggling doesn't make you a bad parent, just as being a child who is struggling doesn't make your child a bad kid. I think that's really, really important. So now let's dive into some of the meat of the presentation. When to worry. The good news is that you are well equipped with a parent radar. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, what that means. But it basically, in a nutshell, all of your spidey senses and everything tell you when to worry. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to decide when to worry and what to do if you're not sure. So you're probably getting all kinds of messages from the universe about your child if your child is struggling. You could be hearing things like, my daughter does this, does yours, or, you know, somebody else says, my son's friend has more words than my son and, and is more social. You're hearing about different children's experiences. Your child's teacher might have some concerns, the family doctor. You Google things and you find scary things that make you worry. And sometimes you just wonder, like, is this something that all children go through or is this something that is just a stage? Or should I worry? Or how will I know how this is going to impact on my child's life? So basically, this is just a cluster of all the things you could you might be worrying about. So the first thing to do is to try to tame some of the worries because otherwise you can be in free flowing anxiety mode and you're paralyzed. You can't take any action. So something I find useful is to ask myself, how much control do I have over this situation? What can I do right now to solve the problem? There are some things maybe on a Friday night you're worried about that you can't realistically deal with until a Monday morning. So you can sort of almost like forward that worry to Monday morning for yourself so that you aren't totally obsessed with it all weekend long. You can also ask yourself clarifying questions like, what will happen if I stop thinking about this situation? What will happen if I do nothing about this situation? Some things are worth putting on the back burner. Other things are much more pressing and important, and you do have to um, you know, find a way to move forward looking for solutions. So coping with the worry. Huge, huge thing is to reach out for support from other parents who have walked this walk and from support and advocacy groups. Two that I think extremely highly of are the Institute of Families for Child and Youth Mental Health. I've given you their website there. And Parents for Children's Mental Health. Again, I've provided a web link. Both groups understand how hard it is to have a child who's struggling, and they are great at helping you to figure out how to navigate systems, how to tap into support, and just to listen and hear you on a day when you're really scared about what is going on with your child now and what this might mean down the future. Another strategy, of course, is to tap into the expertise of other trusted adults, ideally people who know your child well and who can either Put your mind at ease on some issues or confirm that you are on the right track and that you have, you're, you know, you're doing the right thing, trusting your gut instinct to reach out for additional information and support. 
do your homework. Consider what types of behaviors are age appropriate and which ones are not. Don't forget that if your child is delayed in some way, maybe they were born prematurely, you want to, you know, adjust for that a little bit. And you have to also recognize that there is a wide range of, of times when children hit particular milestones and so on. So know what's kind of in the ballpark and if your child is deviating too much from that, then check it out. Become alert to warning signs that could, there could be a problem. When children are quite young, their behavior is their, their error message, like what you'd get on a computer. A child who's acting out is trying to tell you something. So what you're trying to do is to figure out what that something is. So if there's one thing I can really stress here is err on the side of caution. To do, or, Treatment list, diagnostic list, they're all very long. And so you want to caution in terms of tapping into support and treatment or getting on the right waiting list sooner rather than later. Parents say to me, well, what if I'm wrong? What if my child is doing wonderfully well and, and you know, I bring them in and somebody assesses them and says, your child doesn't have a problem. What's your problem? Well, wouldn't that be a wonderful problem to have, to have somebody say, no need to worry and send you on your way? I just think it's really important to sort of look at the opposite scenario of maybe not getting on a waiting list and waiting too long and having to wait years to get the right service for your child. So I think just err on the side of caution and move forward sooner rather than later. At the same time, understand that things won't always be this difficult for your child and your family. Hold on to hope and know things that can get a lot better and that knowing what you're dealing with begins to make things feel a lot better. So let's talk a little bit about knowing when to act. Just some very brief points here. You're seeing moderate to severe behavior changes. You're seeing more intense and frequent types of acting out behavior. You're really worried and you're hearing from other people in your child's life that they're worried too. Your child is not meeting some key developmental milestones or is backsliding. Your child is telling you that they need help. This could be with words with an older child or this could be with behavior with a younger child or it could be a mix. And worry about your child is taking its toll on the rest of your life. I remember how scary it was when my daughter was climbing out the window at night and I was worried about her safety. I remember how terrified I was when I read stuff on the internet about what the future might hold for my youngest when he had a scary kind of diagnosis looming and, and thinking, will he ever be happy? Will he ever have a relationship? Will he ever have a job? I know what it's like to carry all those worries. I know that how hard it is to go on with your life. And I would just warn you that there is a high potential for burnout and for um, for you to go through a difficult time. So you need to look out for yourself too. We're going to be returning to the topic of self-care a little bit later on, but I wanted to flag that for you because this is so personal for me. I did not sleep well for a long time. I gained 100 pounds, and then I had to work really hard to lose that weight again. I don't want you to have to go through that to the same extent. Okay, just... And I think one thing I really want to stress is that sometimes the only way to relieve the worry is to figure out what it is you're dealing with, because then you have an action plan that can help you to move forward. But let's talk about today. Let's talk about trying to make things better for your child starting right now. I want to pass along a couple of parenting strategies that I think are really key and that um, that seem to really help. It doesn't matter if you don't have a diagnosis, you can use these regardless of what is going on with your child. I think the first thing is just to realize or to ask yourself a clarifying question, which is, what does my child need from me right now? Sometimes you're so caught up in the emotion and the frustration and the feelings of overwhelm and worry and guilt and layers of emotion that you lose sight of the fact that maybe all your child really wants is a little bit of your time and attention right now, or they want you to troubleshoot that horrible tag on their sweater that they can't cope with or the annoying noise or they need space from their sibling. Just zero in on what it is and try to make that piece better. Another strategy is to validate your child's feelings. This is so powerful. 
If you think about how much it means to a child to know that they're really heard, if they're saying to you, you know, I can't go to sleep, there might be a thunderstorm tonight, I'm, I'm scared of thunderstorms, you don't have to necessarily share their, their fear of thunderstorms to try to make things better. What you can say is, that makes so much sense. Everybody is afraid of sudden loud noises. And then when your child feels that they've really been heard, then that free-flowing anxiety can be, uh, can be managed. You can start troubleshooting some solutions together. But until a child really feels heard, then they're not ready to have that conversation because they're thinking, you just don't understand. We've all had that feeling, maybe in an argument at work or with a spouse or something. Until you feel heard, you can't move on to problem-solving mode. A third strategy, and this is so hard, this one, but is to be a calming presence yourself so that your child can rely on you to help regulate their out-of-control feelings. I remember when Ian was around 10, sometimes I'd be chopping vegetables at the kitchen counter, and he would come and he would just put his head on my shoulder while I was chopping vegetables. Or he'd make an excuse to lean up against me on the couch because he just wanted to have that comfort and connection. Of course, in order to be a calming presence to, your, presence to your child, you have to be calm yourself. And that is the tough part, putting the brakes on and, uh, and being able to regulate your own emotions. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but I think I also just wanted to make the point that self-compassion is key. If you had a friend who was going through a really hard time with your child, you wouldn't say mean things to that friend like, pull it together, or you're such a loser, or something like that, or you're such a bad parent. You'd never say things like that to your friend, but sometimes we hear ourselves saying those kind of things in our own head, and that makes parenting so much harder. It's so much better if you can change that voice in your head to something less critical and uh, and just feel how good it feels to to take active care of yourself, not just to say, I'm doing the best in a difficult situation, but to think about what would make things better for yourself starting right now. Very briefly on the topic of stress management, I didn't know until a couple of years ago that we have to take active steps to both bring down the amount of negative emotion in our life and to boost the amount of positive emotion. I'll just give you one quick example from my own life. I just discovered in the last few years how amazing walking is as a means of relieving anxiety. So if, if my emotions and my stress level is sky high, sometimes if I go for a walk, I can cope with it after that. So that is really important to know. It's also really important to recognize that the strategies that work for you might not necessarily be the same strategies that work for your child. So part of your job as a parent is to help your child to identify the tools in their stress management toolkit. And it will take some experimenting, but it feels so good when you find something that works to help them feel so much better. We're going to return to the topic of self-care at the end, so I'm going to skip ahead to the next slide and talk a little bit about more sources of information and support, because sometimes when you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed, it's hard to even know where to go for help. So. Here on this screen, we have a whole long list of different options. There's everything from um, private resources to government and nonprofit agencies to your family doctor to your child's educators, whether it's preschool or um, school-aged, other experienced parents. And you want to pool all those sources of information to start figuring out what it is you're dealing with and how you can be of help to your child. So we're going to talk a little bit now about preparing for a professional opinion. At first, it seems like you can carry all this information in your head, but very quickly you realize the importance of keeping good records because you might have to fill out all kinds of questionnaires about your child's behavior over time. It's helpful if you keep those in a binder so that that way you can refer back to them and the names of different clinicians your child has seen and and how different how their level of functioning may be changing over time. All those kind of things that are important. And sometimes if you're in the moment in a meeting with a with a doctor or somebody, it's hard to sort of pull all that really important information top of mind as you need it. So so start taking notes and particularly notice 
things that might be triggers for your child, different situations and settings that might be making things more difficult, family circumstances. Sometimes tragic things happen in families that are beyond your control, but it could be influencing your child's behavior and coping ability. Talk also about what you've done to try to help, what's worked and what's not, because I don't have to tell you this, but you're the expert when it comes to your child. All the other people at the table are bringing all kinds of amazing clinical skills that nobody has known your child as long or as intensely as you know them. At this point, um, somebody, I think Natalie, you were going to comment briefly about extended health care benefits and how these can be of health, correct? Yes, I think when you're looking at what, what professionals can support your child, it's great to look at extended health benefits and what's available to you in that package. I can say um, that for us, I know that speech, physio, and psychology are pretty well covered under most extended health benefits plans in Canada. Occupational therapy is sometimes covered, and one thing a lot of parents don't know is that since parents are such an important component of children's therapy, oftentimes benefits companies will cover parent training as well, which gives you um, kind of a bigger pot to work with than you have if it's just being building your child's name. That's really great stuff to know. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to add in. If you saw my desk here, you'd say, holy, because I've got 10 million little pieces of paper here. But I really wanted to just stress that when you're trying to pull together those notes for that first meeting with somebody who might do a diagnosis for your child, if you can get input from multiple people to bring to that meeting and in multiple settings, that can be so helpful in making a diagnosis. So maybe talk to relatives or, or neighbors or, you know, teachers, people who know your child well and get their input. And then if you can bring their input as well, you're just going to help to move the process along sooner so that that way you don't feel like you're now being sent away for the next three months to gather information that maybe you could have brought with you in the first place. So yes, let's talk about the waiting game. This part is so hard and it can be heartbreaking to hear that a waiting list is months long or years long and you're thinking, but my child needs help right now. This is where it is your job to be the squeaky wheel, the parent who doesn't give up and who keeps making phone calls. Sometimes you have to push a little bit, but you can do so in a way where people want to help you and you don't want to come across as somebody difficult that they don't want to help, but rather somebody who cares passionately about your, their child and who is willing to do anything they can to sort of, you know, make the connections happen that need to be happening. What you may be feeling in the meantime, frustration, hopelessness, worry, all these emotions make total sense and you have every right to feel them. Where it's helpful, what's helpful to do with those emotions is to to vent them with a friend so that that way when you have to continue advocating for your child, then you can do so from a place of semi-rationality and semi-calmness. You're likely to still be upset, but you'll come across as somebody who's trying to make alliances with the, the people who will be doing the diagnosis and so on. Um, other things you can do in the meantime, cultivate your, your support circle. You know how we have that expression, it takes a village to raise a child? You want to reach out to all the members of your parenting village and line up as, some, as much support as you can from them. You also want to learn from those parents because they have experience in navigating these systems and they can tell you, you know, oh, well, if you're on that waiting list, you might want to do this because that helped us. It's invaluable, the information you get from other parents. Then self-care. I'm going to talk again about self-care and what that means, but just, just a quick little reminder to yourself that you need to take care of yourself. It's not a luxury taking care of yourself when your child is struggling. It's a necessity. It's self-preservation and that you're actually caring for your child by caring for yourself. Okay, so what can we do in terms of self-care? A couple of things. First of all, accept the fact that this is a stressful situation for you, your child, and your family. You may reach that conclusion very quickly, or it may take you time to really accept how difficult this really is. And you may want to pare down some of your non-essential commitments. Maybe this isn't the time to volunteer to be the treasurer of your local volunteer association, unless, of course, being treasurer brings you joy. It might not bring me joy, but it would bring you joy, maybe. Create a circle of support for yourself with people who will 
refuel you, lend practical assistance, reassure you that you're doing all the right things, rewrite that inner dialogue in your head like we were talking about before so that you're being as kind to yourself as you would to any other person who is struggling. Good nutrition. Our bodies actually need healthy food to fuel themselves. And sometimes when we get stressed or overwhelmed, we forget to feed ourselves good food. We feed ourselves the wrong food or we forget to eat it all. So just a little reminder that nutrition does count. Ditto for sleep. Your ability to, to concentrate or solve problems or manage your own emotions nosedives when you aren't getting any sleep. So do the best you can to get some sleep. And if you're having a hard time sleeping, or your child's situation is making it impossible for you to get sleep on a regular basis, you really need to let people on your child's care team and your care team know because nobody can go long-term without sleep. My, I'm just flagging again my late-in-life discovery that exercise is actually a wonderful stress-relieving thing. And so if you're feeling like you're hitting the wall, maybe a stomp around the block, or a brisk walk with a friend or something like that could be what you really, really need to. Natalie, I think you were going to pick up on this final point on this slide. Yes, a lot of people, I find that a lot of people don't know that they have an EAP program with their extended health benefits. So it's great to look into your benefits and see if you do have an employee assistance program, which would likely include ESAP services as well. And through those types of programs, you can access counseling, which would be someone that maybe even in that inner circle if you need someone different and out of that circle to speak to. Um, there's also nutrition services and all different kinds of things. So you'd have to look at what's specifically available in your package, but really reviewing those benefits can help you not just to help your child, but also to help yourself. So important. So I'm now moving to the final page here of um, tools and resources and so on, just to sort of let you know what's out there. I've compiled on my website a directory of children's mental health and neurodevelopmental and behavioral type resources with a strong emphasis on Canadian resources. So you can find that online. I obviously have just written a book on this topic, trying to weave together the experiences of about 50 different parents who were incredibly generous with their, their family stories in the hope of helping other parents. Then of course we have the Morneau Chappelle so, um, Children's Support Solutions, contact information, and at the bottom of the page there, these are those two parent support and advocacy groups that I feel do such amazing work in supporting parents. So I would suggest trying to reach out to some or all of these just to, to tap into additional sources of support. So now I'll let you handle the exciting announcement department, Natalie, and then we can go to questions after this. Thanks. Okay, so I wanted to share with everyone that in light of this event, for anyone that mentions Ann Douglas, if they call Children's Support Solutions, and the 800 number is at the bottom of the screen, um, we're happy to waive the registration fee just because all of you attended, and we wanted to extend a special thank you to you all. So our registration fee is waived if you call in the next 10 days, so before May 5th. Wow. I, f I feel really special knowing that if somebody <laughs> says they know me, that it gets them, you know, a special thing. So thanks for making it special. So can you explain how the question process works and maybe remind me at the same time, just so that that way I don't watch the technology on people? Sure thing. So at this time we have about 20 to 30 more minutes for questions and answers. If you look at your screen in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that there's a messenger function. So you just type your question in there, and then Anne will be reading the questions. Keep in mind, she's going to get a lot of questions. Um, so she, if, you, if your question isn't answered, we'll be following up, and we'll have all of the questions. And so we're hoping to send that out and share. All, we want to answer all of your questions. It just might not be in the next 30 minutes. So we wanted to let you know that. Um, and I think so. I have a couple of sort of technical questions that I'll probably just throw back to you, Natalie. Um, one of the questions is, will the PowerPoint slides be available to us by email? And um, somebody else asked a similar question, which is, um, 
their friend really would have wanted to be here tonight but wasn't able to attend, so how can they tap into the information in tonight's presentation? Absolutely, that's a great question and we're happy to say that this has been recorded and so the recording will actually be posted on the website for you to share. Perfect. Okay, now I think I'm going to dive into some sort of content related questions. Heather asks um, how I kept my hope alive through this time. She says she finds that so hard. It is so hard and there were times that um, I remember crying so hard I couldn't breathe. So that tells you, you know, how it was so awful. I remember entire months when I didn't get anything done on my to-do list other than making panicked phone calls. There are times when you just know you're sort of hitting rock bottom. The good news is that things did start to turn around and that I was able to, I think, from learning from my daughter's situation, which was so intense that by the time I was dealing with challenges with the younger boys, I guess I had been trained for that, or if you want to look at it that way. In terms of holding on to hope, I guess it also helps that I'm kind of a fierce optimist, and even at the worst of times, I never allowed myself to consider the possibility that the children wouldn't go on to thrive ultimately. So I think maybe a little bit of optimism and genetic stubbornness were helpful there. So, so the next question is, when is it time to pursue inpatient or day therapy? You're at your wit's end. My heart goes out to you, Robin, and I think that that would be a good question to talk to maybe like when you hear from the, the Chappelle people later on, um, the Children's Support Services people, maybe to ask them for some specific recommendations based on when you live or where you live and and your child situation and so on. I totally hear you regarding wit's end. I remember how scared I was when I brought my daughter home from the hospital after her suicide attempt and feeling like I just didn't know how I was going to keep her safe. It was, it was just a terrible, terrible time. So um, the next question is, when a child is diagnosed with ADHD, what options are there other than medications and what are your thoughts on ADHD medications? I definitely have some thoughts on ADHD medications, and I, but I also think that it's really important that we not think that a medication is going to be a cure-all for anything, whether it's depression or ADHD or whatever. I think that it is a tool that sometimes allows a child to to function well enough that they can then do the learning of learning how to manage their ADHD. The tough thing about medica the medication issue is that people will judge you and say that you're doing the wrong thing no matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you decide to use medication or not to use medication. So you have to be fairly confident within yourself that you've made the best decision possible. And sometimes you have to be prepared to say to other people, um, thank you so much for your concern. I just want to let you know that this is an issue we looked at at great length and we discussed with our child's doctor and we looked at in other situations and we honestly feel that this is the best decision for our child right now. And that doesn't mean that medication would be the right decision or the wrong decision forever. It just means that you've committed to this particular course of action for now and you're going to reevaluate it. But just don't feel that you're doing it wrong if people are second guessing you because unfortunately that's sometimes what happens when you're a parent. Yes, Susan has a question and she says, there seem to be so few supports for young adults with mental illnesses as far as OHIP covered counseling is concerned. Any ideas? This is really, really frustrating. I, I'm, obviously, I'm somebody who writes a lot about parenting and I see a huge amount of interest and emphasis and resources during the very early years. Then sometimes during the school years, sometimes children fall through the crack as they go from sort of like one funding envelope to another fund, funding envelope. And then there's a total disruption when kids get to be in their late teens and they have to go from the child system to the young or to the adult system and, and so on. And finding care that is funded is a huge problem. And I think that there aren't any easy answers here. There are different sources of funding. I know on the Children's Support Services website, they have actually a page that is about funding and different ways of tapping into funding. So I think it's worth looking at that. But in terms of 
Um, public accessibility, I know that the Psychological Association, I can't remember if it's the Canadian one or the Ontario one, they are lobbying to have more of their services funded publicly and I think that would be an amazing thing in terms of increasing capacity in the system because a week or a day can feel like a million years when your child is struggling and so we don't really have time to wait. I think that it's so critical that every family be able to access access these services like when they need them, not months or years after the fact. So probably that was a little more passionate of an answer than what you, you maybe wanted, but I just wanted to say I totally understand. Okay, just reading down the... Okay, um, somebody wants to know about getting a second opinion. And I think that there are sort of times when it makes sense to get another opinion because maybe you're concerned that the person hasn't taken into account everything that you know about your child or some, your gut instinct is just telling you, you know what, it just doesn't quite ring true for me. So I think there's nothing wrong with asking to have another opinion and also recognizing that a diagnosis can and often does evolve over time. So something that made sense as a working diagnosis when your child was in grade three, your child's going to be kind of a different person by the time they're in high school. So maybe that diagnosis doesn't fit anymore and, and you want to reevaluate that. Um, the other part of your question was about what happens if you've developed a good relationship with the psychologist or the clinician. Well, that is a win. I mean, it's fantastic if you have a great working relationship, but you can certainly raise the issue of getting another opinion. And somebody who's truly professional and has your family's best interest at, at heart, they aren't going to question that. They're going to applaud you for wanting to be very thorough. So, And they can certainly be involved in, in that whole process as well. The next question is how to deal with eating disorders. That is so hard. So frustrating, I would say it is imperative to find a way to have family counseling. It was the only way we were able to deal with the whole issue because I think that, you know, everybody in the family is affected when a child's behavior is very dramatic and also when their needs are very acute. So that would be my recommendation to look for a way to deal with the um, the eating disorder at the family level as opposed to just thinking it's your child's problem. In fact, some of the parents I interviewed for my book did a really good job of saying repeatedly that it's important to take a family systems kind of approach to all types of struggles because when one family member is affected, every other family member is affected, not the least of which are siblings, I might add. There are times when your other children may resent the time and attention that the child who's really struggling is receiving, and then they can feel horribly guilty for feeling that way. So at least if you have a way of talking through those things and trying to set parenting limits for them and for your other kids, it just sort of feels like you have some support on those difficult issues. Another person says that her partner likely has Asperger's. She feels like she has two kids who are struggling. How can she be both parents at once? Well, the genetic lottery is such that sometimes we do end up with a lot of issues in the same family. I should add that I live with bipolar disorder myself and that my mom had bipolar disorder. So I sort of feel like in our family, we pass down genes that put us, you know, I guess mental health is our specialty in our family, I would say. So sometimes you do have one or more parents who are struggling with their own issues. On the downside, this can make it extra challenging. On the upside, it also allows unusual insights. For example, I know what it feels like to be a person who gets very anxious at times. So when one of my children is going through a hard time with anxiety, I can relate and I can share strategies and I can know that it's not a made up thing. It's real what they're dealing with. So, but I think just in practical terms, definitely line up as much outside support as you can because it is really hard and you know to try to have those conversations with your partner in a way where they don't feel like you're trying to blame them or whatever 
sometimes it's helpful to go for couples counseling or or family counseling. At one point, we were having um, the kids, some of the kids were having individual counseling. We were going for marriage counseling, and we were going for family counseling as well. And it it honestly took a lot of work on a lot of levels to sort of get things working. So, okay. Um, Another parent asked, what is the best way to advocate for my son to get a psych ed assessment done? The school thinks he's doing fine with the supports he has in place, but I know he has so much more potential. Well, first of all, I wish that there were enough psych ed assessments to go around. I get kind of grumpy about this issue because I think that if we need to find out how what a child needs in order to thrive in the education system, then we need to make that available. Um, I worry when people have to spend a lot of money to get an assessment years ahead of, you know, what they would be able to be entitled to in the school system. I worry about that a lot because that means it's not accessible to a lot of people. So I would say to keep pressing at the school level and say how important it is. Talk about what you're seeing and the kinds of behaviors that you feel that really need to be diagnosed and pinned down so that that way there can be effective strategies in place. And maybe you'll be lucky enough to find an ally or two at the school. Sometimes it's a special ed or resource teacher or, you know, a vice principal if you're lucky enough to still have one at your school. And um, But somebody who takes a personal interest in your child and who is willing to, you know, move heaven and earth to make things happen. So I hope that will be the case for your son. Um, the next question, my daughter has been diagnosed with anxiety. She has a difficult time concentrating and will study and forget material when writing the test. This is apparently anxiety related. What can I do to relieve the anxiety? I think this is probably something where um, therapy could be helpful because sometimes a child can learn practical strategies for managing the anxiety and also if you meet with the school and the teacher, you can change the environment a bit. A lot of people have difficulty with test anxiety, and there are things that can be done. It could be a simple matter of um, giving your daughter a little more time or figuring out, like, are, are there certain situations that really trigger her anxiety? I mean, if you ever wrote exams in a, in a high school gym with 10 million other children around you or 10 million other kids around you, you know that some exam situations are highly anxiety producing. So for somebody who has a hard time with anxiety, that just makes it that much more difficult. Um, so I would say strategies and working with a counselor who can um, help her to identify strategies that will help her. A nice person says, thank you. Well, thank you for participating too. Um, another question here. My son has some extreme learning disabilities. He is in, he is 13 and in grade seven. However, his level of understanding is only in grade two. Um, am I aware of any programs for children with learning disabilities? I'm not sure if you've connected with the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario, but they have chapters in a lot of cities. I'm not sure if you're in Ontario or if you're in another part of the country, actually, but your local Learning Disabilities Association can do amazing things. One of my children went to programs and learned how to sort of, um, you know, structure his learning so that that way he could divide whatever he was working on into manageable chunks and how to get oriented with different software programs that were very helpful. So I think there are some of those practical tools and supports. And I know I, I see your, your worry is that he's, there's like about a five-year gap in between his age and his level of functioning. I can tell you that that was the case with my son Eric at one point, that he was many, many years behind. I remember at one point when he was in grade five, bursting into tears myself, realizing that he didn't understand what capital letters were. He didn't know what punctuation was. And all of his writing was just like a blur of stream of consciousness. There was no structure to anything, and I, and I had such huge worries for him. However, he has come so far. So I think that when there is a lot of support and determination and appropriate resources and early intervention, amazing things can happen, and I hope you can tap into some of those supports. I'm sure that the folks, again, at Children's Support Services would be happy to make some recommendations behind the scenes and stuff and talk to you about, uh, you know, what might be available in your part of the country because that's what they're here to do. Another 
person wants to know about the difference between social workers and psychologists and psychotherapists, there are definitions, and I probably couldn't do justice to them all sort of just live off the top of my head, but basically it's a matter of training. So a psychiatrist, for example, is a medical doctor who specializes in the brain and behavior and that kind of thing, whereas um, people in other kind of clinical professions have had different types of training. But there's also sometimes um, an attitude or systems approach, like in some some cases people assume that everybody can thrive or that the family is should be treated together. Like there can be schools of thought that are also really important. So I think that it's worth exploring all of those different things and looking at the like what kind of care would be best for your, in this case you say you have a, a teenage boy. I also think when we're talking about teenagers in counseling, it is so important to have a counselor that they can engage with because otherwise they just won't go. I mean, you can you can lead a, a child to counseling, but you can't make them participate, just like the proverbial horse and water. And if your child is resistant to counseling, then it is really, really hard. I remember at one point my daughter would wear a teenage a t-shirt to her counseling appointments, and the t-shirt said, "My problem is you." So she was sort of having her say and, and not wanting to cooperate for a long time. But when she decided that she wanted to go for counseling and actively engaged in it, it was like miraculous, the transformation. But she had to find somebody that she connected with and that she respected because you know how teenagers can be. I mean, they're, they're very uh, able to see a gap between somebody who is going through the motions of caring or really caring. and. Uh, they're just not going to give somebody the time of day if they don't feel that there's that genuine caring. A parent asks what to do if their daughter is physically abusive and can't control herself. Well, this is a totally heartbreaking situation. And I think that it's a case of thinking through ahead of time what your safety plan is going to be and having a way of, of reaching for outside support because if it's getting to the point where it's dangerous and your child is only going to get bigger and stronger as she gets older, I think you have to talk through and, and think through some of those really difficult and painful issues. And I'm so sorry you're dealing with that. Okie doke. Um, somebody is looking for some specific recommendations for resources for teenagers with borderline personality disorder. There is a lot of really good material on dialectical behavioral therapy, so that might be something that you might want to look into. I know waiting lists can be very long, but that particular treatment method seems to offer a lot of promise. Um, in terms of getting help sooner rather than later, again, I think I'm going to let the Children's Support Services people help you out behind the scenes with that one. Somebody else asked, how did I know when I found the right treatment or combination of treatment? For a long time, I wasn't sure. It sort of felt like we had to try different things. And um, But I think that the family piece was really key, having the family counseling, so that that way all of the children had a forum to express their concerns and worries. And we could just feel like we were we were working on this whole project together. It sounds crazy to think of you know it as a project, but it felt that way that we would all get together and we would try to figure out what would make things better for everybody. Any tips on how to get your spouse involved in counseling? Oh, I wish my husband was home for his meeting right now because then he could answer this one directly. But I think I told him that it was really, really critical for the health of our children, and he is a very committed father, so I think he realized that it might be painful, it might be embarrassing, it might be a pain in the butt, it might be the least favorite thing on his calendar in any given week, but that it was also crucially important for our kids. So, and also, I remember him saying to somebody at one point, he was also worried that um, he'd be left behind if he was the only family member who wasn't doing the hard work of, of counseling. So he figured he'd better get in there, roll up his sleeves, and be part of the, the solution, right? Okay. Sometimes it's hard to read and answer at the same time. 
somebody is looking for recommendations for ADHD support groups in the Toronto area, well, there is an amazing resource called CADAC, which is C-A-D-D-A-C dot C-A. And if I've botched that in any way, please come and find me on Twitter and I'll find it for you. Or look in the resource guide on my website. It's like the, it's the Canadian Association that focuses on ADHD and they sometimes have workshops. I know they have conferences. They have staff in their office who provide a lot of practical support to parents and are just a listening ear. They also have an amazing website with tons of resources on, you know, how to manage common behaviors. I see here you say in your note to me that you have two boys, both with ADHD, and they can drive you around the bend some days. Oh, yeah, I remember that because it almost it's like having, um, you know, two balls that are in motion bouncing against each other. There's like an amplification, I think, when you have multiple children with ADHD. And another question is about strategies to help kids get along, siblings in this case, where both the children have some challenges and they're fighting nonstop. And the, the parent says, my daughter is so sad, she thinks her brother will never love her. Oh, that is so sad. I think that when children are dealing with really challenging issues, sometimes it's easy to assume that that's sort of the only thing that's at the root of the problem. But most siblings go through times when they are a little bit inclined to not appreciate each other too much. I actually just wrote a little post on this topic for the Mumstown Canada website. Um, if you go to mumstown.ca and search on the word siblings, I think you'll be able to find the column along with a bunch of other related columns. And basically in my piece, I just talked about how with siblings, sometimes it's like the long game that you're playing. You're trying to lay the groundwork now for them to have um, really happy and healthy relationships down the, the road. Sometimes it can feel like you're doing a heck of a lot of work now and not seeing a lot of payoff, but I can tell you, I wasn't always the nicest sister to one of my sisters, and we're great buddies now. So there is hope. Okay. Um, somebody else is asking about social skills training and so on. There are amazing social skills training programs available for children, and they're so important. I think sometimes we assume that every child arrives on the planet knowing how to be a friend and how to understand things like how close do you stand to somebody and if somebody's being boring when they're talking, is it okay to talk over top of that person and just interrupt them? Well, these are all things that we learn, some of us more intuitively than others, and so you can find social skills programs that will help your child to learn the rules of social engagement. I say this as a, a socially awkward person myself. I mean, when I was a little kid, I was the kid who didn't want to play the birthday party games. I wanted to sit upstairs and talk to the adults. And I remember what that felt like. And on the one hand, I felt sort of like I was different than the other kids and I didn't understand how to play with them. But on the other hand, I also liked talking to the adults because they were kind of interesting. So anyways, um, another parent is asking, what kind of strategies to use for a preteen who doesn't communicate well, how to ex explain body changes? That is an excellent question, and I think that I would direct you, direct you to one of the local community living um, centers. There's ones in a whole bunch of different communities because I think they have all kinds of developmentally appropriate resources for talking about puberty and the facts of life and all that kind of thing. And they also really emphasize the importance of sex education because you can't just assume that um, a preteen or teen is not going to have sexual feelings, and those are important conversations to have. Another parent is asking about thoughts on ODD, which is oppositional defiant disorder and how to manage outbursts and defiance. I think that trying to avoid problem situations and helping your child to learn how to identify his triggers and to manage those triggers is key. Um, sometimes as adults, we assume that children have coping strategies and skills that they just haven't developed yet. So if you can help your child to learn what situations he finds really challenging, and to come up with plans in advance that he can sort of put into place in those situations, then that can help to sort of 
short circuit some of the the um, situations that would otherwise result in kind of unpleasant disruptions. Okie dokie. Another parent is saying that their child is struggling with anxiety and ADHD. The school isn't seeing anything out of the ordinary, but everything that is happening is happening on the home front. What do I recommend? I definitely recommend seeking support because it could be that your child is having problems in multiple arenas. Maybe, you know, if you tried to sign them up for gymnastics or for hockey or something like that, it would become apparent that it is something that happens more than just at home. And also just to learn some strategies for helping a child to manage anxiety because I think sometimes we think that anxiety is something that a person can turn on and off fairly easily, but it's not. It, it's a real challenge to to live with. So I think that if you can help your child again to figure out some of the triggers and to figure out how to cope, how to park worries, how to um, think through like what would be the worst thing that could happen in this case. Obviously you don't want to do it if it's like a really scary thing, but sometimes it's like what would be the worst thing if you forgot your gym clothes on gym day? You know, it wouldn't be the end of the world. This is how we would handle it, you know, and just to have some of those kind of discussions. And I think I'm going to have to make this my last question. Um, and there's about five questions left, which breaks my heart. Um, I think somebody is talking about how, oh, do, it, do I have time to finish this? I do. Okay. Um, somebody is saying how they were their child was very suicidal last year and that they started intense weekly therapy sessions. Um, they were wondering if it was a good thing to tell their child that they might be in therapy for a very long time. I think you want to be realistic with your child. If you think that they're going to be going to these appointments on an ongoing basis, then it's only fair to let them know that so they don't think it's just a one one-time thing. And you can also give them hope that it could be that they'll learn some skills and that they won't have to go as often if they don't particularly enjoy the sessions and really celebrate the progress. Highlight the times when, you know, last year you could never have gone to that birthday party by yourself and this year you went and look, you had a great time. Look how far you've come. Celebrate those many milestones. So I do still have a few questions that um, Maybe we can carry over to the next chat. I'm sorry I didn't get to them all I tried, and I, I know how awful it feels when you have a question and your child is struggling. But Natalie, I think I have to throw it back to you. Perfect, thank you. So if we didn't get to your questions, right, we will get to your question and we can answer any additional questions in the follow-up and then we're also going to take any questions that we had in consideration for events that we're going to be hosting in the future, like the one that's coming up on the 28th. So just a few final bits here before everyone's likely off to bed. And if you're looking for more information about services, funding sources, or want help now, please feel free to visit our website. And if you're one of the 20 lucky winners of a Parenting Food of Storm book signed by Anne, you'll get an email this week confirming, um, and your book will be in the mail. So congratulations to all of you. If you'd like to attend more events like this or have some great ideas of events you think we should host, please fill out the short survey after this presentation. Thank you so much to everyone for attending today, and a big sparkly thanks to Anne for your wonderful webinar. Have a great night, everyone. And thanks, everybody, for your heartfelt questions. I really appreciate them.